We're gonna continue uh, this series called Kingdom Culture as Paul writes a letter to the church in Colossae. And as you get there, I wanted to uh, bring you into the, this, if you're not you know, aware that this is the end of spring break in Oklahoma, right? All, all, all of the kids have been out of school for a week. And so for all of you who have been staycationing with your children, bless you. I hope uh, t- tomorrow's a wonderful day. Uh, but you know, it got me thinking, whether you are in a staycation mode or you are in a vacation mode this week, um, I think about my vacations. And I think about, in general, what we do when we have time off is most of us, I think I'm pretty safe in saying, we like to go places that kind of put us in a position of awe, right? We like to go to places that are really cool to look at. And I'm a mountain person. When I get time off, I want to go to the mountains every time. Like It's just the, the, the magnificence of the, of the mountains of Colorado are, are just, it's my favorite place. Or maybe for you, it's the ocean and just the, the expanse of all the water that you get to watch. Or maybe you're one of those people that just likes to go maybe to a place like Arizona and look at a big hole in the ground and be at awe, right? If you've ever been, it's, it's awe-inspiring. Or you know, maybe we go back to last week and we go back to the Magic Kingdom, right? And you go on a roller coaster and it puts you in awe because you feel like you got this close to death, right? Like it's just that adrenaline rush. Like whatever it is, whoever you are, I think it's pretty, pretty safe to say in our human condition, there's something about us that likes to feel small, that we like to put ourselves in positions to sit back and look at awesome. And I truly mean that, awesome. We love to be in those positions. And so here in Oklahoma, we go to places like the mountains, we go to the Grand Canyon, we go to the ocean. And and it's made me start thinking, well, where do people who live in awesome places, where do they go? Because awesome, like our awesome is, is there every day, right? And so I've got a brother, he's, he lives in Colorado, so I, I reached out to him this week and said, hey, where do people who live in Colorado go for awesome? Where do they go for vacation? He's like, well, typically people there, they go to California, ocean, or they go to Hawaii, ocean, or they go to somewhere in Mexico, beaches and ocean, right? And I was like, you know, it's an interesting thought to think about that that where we go to be odd is ordinary for them. And ordinary comes from familiarity, is when we become familiar with something, it eventually becomes ordinary. And so whether you are in Oklahoma, because let's be honest, no one vacations in Oklahoma. You know, like, I mean, I love living here. Right, but no one's like, "Hey, let's go on vacation in Oklahoma." They go to the mountains, they go to the ocean, like they go to the Grand Canyon. But here's my point: is wherever you are, that becomes familiar, right? It becomes ordinary, and so we need to get out of the ordinary. And so I wonder if sometimes Jesus can become ordinary, because we go to church every week. For many of you, we grow up in the Bible Belt of America. We go to Christmas Eve and we go to Easter. And, and so in, and by no fault of our own, Jesus maybe has drifted into that familiar territory of just being ordinary. And I wonder it's, if it's in that ordinariness of our faith that we start to seek out awesome somewhere else in substances or situations or experiences. The reason I bring that up is this morning, as we look at Colossians chapter one, what Paul is going to do, and what I hope we can rediscover is the awesomeness of Jesus. That he is not ordinary, and and to become familiar with him is not fair to who he is, because he is infinitely interesting. And so this morning, what I would ask that you would do with me is what I do like when I, I, a couple of years ago, I got to go out to the Grand Tetons out in Wyoming. And what, we, what you don't do is you don't just drive on by like, oh, there it is, and you keep going. You stop your car, and you put it in park, and you get out and you just sit there. Like, awesome. This is awesome. And that's what I wanna challenge us to do today. Let's not fly through this text. Let's put it in park. And let's look at what Paul says about the centrality, about the supremacy, and the preeminence and the awesomeness of Jesus. 
So last week we kicked off this series, Kingdom Culture, by defining the word kingdom. It's not something we use very often, so I just wanted to remind us of this definition of the kingdom of God by Dallas Willard, author and philosophy professor. Uh, He says this, the kingdom of God is God reigning. It is wherever what God wants done is done. And so wherever the will of God is done, the kingdom of God is present. And so as Christians, the the kingdom of God is not some far off thing in the future when we die and go to heaven. That's not, that, that is the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is also wherever what God wants done is done. And so Paul, last week, we looked at two prayers that Paul prayed for the church in Colossae. One was to encourage them. I've, I've heard of your faith, he said, and, and, and your faith is actually bearing fruit. You're loving one another. And so he's encouraging them. He's setting the culture of God's kingdom in Colossae. And then he turns the corner in verse nine of the first chapter of Colossians. And he says, but now I'm gonna pray that you would grow in the knowledge of God, bearing fruit in strength, in power, in endurance, in patience. Right, he's emboldening, like he goes, listen, I know your situation's not easy. And so yes, you're, you're, you're being fruitful and faithful, but now, Walk forward with strength and endurance and joy. And so now we see Paul, just as he says, hey, grow in the knowledge. Like he, he's saying, this is what you should do, Colossians, is grow in your knowledge of God, bearing fruit. And his first thought is, I gotta tell him about Jesus. He's like, let me help you grow in your knowledge of God. And he goes into a poem, and now you you probably don't know me that well, but I'll tell you one thing, I am not, I'm not a poet, all right? I do do not read poetry, and so we're not gonna get into this from his terms of like how many stanzas there are and what what the pentameter, or that may not even be the right word, I'm sorry, English teachers, but we're not gonna like dissect poetry, but we need to know that you read poetry differently than you read a narrative. And so we're gonna see a beautiful poem about the awesomeness of Jesus. And this poem is rich in theology and we're just gonna skim the surface of the depth of this passage. There are books and seminary courses just on this passage. And so I wanna get into it. We're gonna read verses 13 through 22 all in one go and then we're gonna come back and look and see. We're gonna put it in park and see what the Apostle Paul has to tell us about the awesomeness of Christ. So follow me here in Colossians 1. Verse 13, Paul writes, for he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through the death through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. What a wonderful passage of scripture. The the depth that Paul goes into describing how wide and how deep is is the, the preeminence of Jesus. Like this passage is, it's almost unfathomable how big and mighty and supreme is Christ. And so let's get to this in verse 13 and 14. We ended last week with this. We're beginning this week. It's just so good. We, we, we can't skip through. We got to do it twice. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And so my first point this morning is that Jesus is king of the kingdom. He is king. 
Oftentimes we talk about Jesus as savior, but he's not just savior, he is king of the kingdom. And this is a thread that we see all throughout scripture that Jesus isn't just the savior, he is the king. In Isaiah nine, this is typically a Christmas passage, so Merry Christmas. Isaiah nine, six through seven, for unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David David, and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. You see, Jesus' kingdom, he is the king of a kingdom that is characterized by never-ending peace, justice, and righteousness. And then Jesus himself in John 18, when he's talking to Pontius Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. He's saying, Pilate, my my kingdom's so much bigger and so much more expansive than what you have in mind, right? The disciples thought, hey, Jesus is gonna come and he's gonna be king over Israel, the people of God, but Jesus said, I got bigger plans. I'm going to redeem all people. My kingdom is bigger. And then at the very end of scripture, in John's vision of the battle of Armageddon, he sees Jesus riding down from heaven on a white horse, waging war against the devil. And in Revelation 19, 16, John writes this, on his, Jesus' robe, and on his thigh has written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, from the Old Testament to the life of Jesus and to the end of time, Jesus is King and Savior. But he is King of the Kingdom And Paul wants to make no mistake that the people of Colossae and for us today, that we make no mistake, Jesus is king. Verse 15, he writes, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, Jesus. So my second point this morning is that Jesus is the mirror image of God. Jesus is the mirror image of God. The, that word image is translated from the Greek word icon. It's where we get the idea of icon, like they're an icon. They're big, they're famous, they represent something. And it says Jesus represents perfectly the Father in heaven, God. It's got two connotations to it, one of likeness and one of manifestation. The likeness would be like on a coin, like you pull out a coin and you see there's a likeness of a president, right, in the United States. We see the likeness of on a coin. But there's also this idea of manifestation of that Jesus actually is God. He's not just like him, he is. And we get this, right, we look like our parents. So it makes sense that Jesus the son would look just like his father. One of my favorite, uh, I've been watching a lot of basketball the last couple days, and one of my favorite commercial campaigns of all time is the new progressive uh, commercials about uh, teaching people to unbecome their parents. Have you seen this? Right? It's the guy that walks around with people and and corrects them like, oh, don't do that, you know, whatever. And uh, one of the ones that sticks out in my mind is when the guy's sitting down reading a book about submarines, and he comes over his shoulder and he says, "Who, who, who else reads books about submarines And the guy just kind of says, my dad, (laughs) right? Because that's what we do. We become like our parents, whether we like it or not. We have the DNA of our parents. And so whether it's our eye color or our facial expressions or our phrases that we grow up hearing over and over, we become like our parents. And so this idea that Jesus is the mirror image of his father should come to no surprise to us. That if we want to know who God is, then we need to know who Jesus is. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In Europe, there's old, ancient 
cathedrals that are just massive. If you've ever been, you know what I'm talking about. You walk in and you just can't help but be in awe of the architecture and the artwork. And there was uh, a problem that started to happen in some of these cathedrals is they're so big that people, unlike us naturally, we started to complain. And their necks were starting to get sore from looking up at the ceiling for so long because it was so amazing. And so what they did, the curator said, hey, we, we gotta fix this problem. We can't have people complaining, right? And so they brought in these trolleys on wheels with mirrors that could bend down like this so that people wouldn't have to look up to see the artwork. They wouldn't have to look up to see the architecture. They could look down into a mirror that then reflected the ceiling down. And that's the image of Jesus, is that we can look at Jesus and see the Father above and say, that is who God is. Because our tendency, and I've seen this too much in my own life, is we tend to look at other people and we tend to look at our circumstances and our situations and come to our conclusions about who God is. And when we look at other people who are not perfect representations of God, our, our view of who God is becomes skewed. So when we read about Jesus, when we hear about Jesus, what we're actually hearing, what we're actually reading is God's character and activity for mankind. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us the heart of God towards people, and we can see it in the life and person of Jesus. Let's keep going, and this time I want you to listen with something in mind. I want you, I want you to listen and see if you can't catch a theme that Paul's trying to pound into our minds uh, as I read through at verse 15. Listen to this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Did you catch the theme? All things. It's three little words, A-L-L, -L, all things. And so my third point this morning is that Jesus is before and over all things. You see, Jesus is supreme in all things. He's not just king over some things, he's king over all things. There is not one thing in his kingdom that he does not reign over. In verse 15, it says he is the firstborn over all creation. Now, our modern ears think about this differently than the original hearers of this, of this letter. We hear birth order, right? That he is the, the, the firstborn. We hear, oh, he must be the oldest. Well, we know that like, he's not the oldest. He's about 2,000 years old, right? And there were people that were born before Jesus. And that's not what Paul means here because the original hearers would have heard not birth order, but title, title as the, the one that had rightful rule over the inheritance of the father, that they were the ones, they were royal, they were firstborn over all creation. And so Jesus is over all of creation. And then we get to verse 18, we see the same language. He's head of the body of the church, the firstborn from among the dead, meaning the resurrected church. That Jesus is king over the creation and the new creation. He's king over it all, the old and the new. There is not one part that Jesus is not the right ruler over. You see, the church isn't ours. It's his. And when it comes to the covenant people of God, Christians, Jesus is never to be in second place. He's always to be in first place because that's his rightful place. What would it look like in our lives? Think about this for a second. What would it look like in our lives if Jesus had the first word in everything? 
if Jesus had the first word in our relationships, if Jesus had the first word in our careers and our jobs, if Jesus had the first word in our parenting, if Jesus had the first word in our marriages, if Jesus had the first word in our finances, what would it look like if Jesus was supreme over all things in our life? I know for me, my life would probably look different because if I'm honest, I like to be king of my kingdom. I like to do the things that I wanna do. I want my will done. (laughs) But as a Christian, I'm submitted to Christ as king. And then in verse 16, we get an even greater depth. And the the, the cadence of this passage is amazing. That he is creator and sustainer, right? Paul says everything was created by him, through him, for him, and in him all things hold together. What an amazing description of the supremacy and awesomeness of Jesus. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him, and all things in him hold together. Like, I don't know about you, but I didn't make my heart beat this morning. I didn't put air in my lungs. I don't think, hey, heartbeat, keep going. All right, do it again. Do it again. It just does it. Jesus is holding all things together. We don't tell gravity to make make sure we're still on the ground. It just happens. We don't tell the sun to rise and the sun to go down. We don't do that. Jesus holds all things together. And so whether it's in the big things or the the, the small things of life or the amazing things of life or just the mundaneness of a sunrise and a sunset and a sunrise and a sunset, Jesus is over all things and he is holding all things together. Jesus is awesome. He is not ordinary. Every person, every sunset, every bird, every flower, every mountain, Every sound that we hear, every feeling that we, we, we have was created by him and for him. There's a Dutch statesman and theologian named Abraham Kuyper who's got a wonderful quote that I had to include. He says this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Jesus is awesome. By him, for him, through him, it, it's all held together by him. Like it, this passage, like we, like it just, it, you could just sit in it forever. Jesus is not ordinary. He is awesome. But what we try and do, because we are fallen people, because we're impatient people, because we, are, we get used to the familiar, is what we try and do I don't even know if we try. We, we just drift into sometimes. Replacing the creator with the created. That Jesus put this, all of this, this world together for our benefit. And we worship the created things of this world and we forget the creator who put it all together, who holds it all together. He is the king over it all. And like it or not, Everything and everyone will one day answer to him because he is king over it all. Like we don't have time to get into the depth of the sovereignty of God and the problem of evil in our world, which we see all day, every day. Like there is the domain of darkness. We've been transferred as Christians from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Jesus. But right now, the kingdom of darkness is still around and we see it all the time. But the comfort we can take is in 2 Corinthians 5.10, and Paul writes this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And so there will be a day where evil is judged. You see, the first time Jesus came, he came as a rescuing savior. But the second time he comes, he will come as a conquering king and judge. And so there's an urgency to our faith that while he has come to offer us redemption, that we take it and we follow him. And for those of you in the room who have been through things that are unfathomably painful, the domain of darkness is real, yes, but King Jesus is over all and everything and everyone will one day stand before him and answer for it. But the good news for us this morning 
is that all the things in your life that are causing anxiety, all the things that cause you frustration, all the things that cause you worry, all the things, right, that God, through Jesus, is over all the things. And so we can bring those things to him. Philippians 4, so we can bring them to him with gratefulness and thanksgiving, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your mind. Paul knew that if the Colossians were going to grow as Christians and continually faithfully bear fruit in this new kingdom of Jesus, they needed to know, as do we, on an ongoing and regular basis, the awesomeness of Jesus. If we are gonna continue in our faith through the midst of this life, we have to know the awesomeness and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Let's continue, verse 19. He finishes out the poem, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. There it is again. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. End of the poem. And Paul begins his letter again in verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So my last point this morning is that Jesus is our savior king. Jesus is our savior king. He's not some king that's just as far off, controlling things far off. He has come in the flesh and said, yes, this is my kingdom. I created it, and now I'm going to enter into it in order to redeem it. What a king. What a king. In verse 21, I love this picture that Paul gives of what Christ has done through the cross we were once, all right, we were in this camp, the dominion of darkness, we were once alienated, hostile in mind, and behaving badly. But he has transferred us into the kingdom of his son, where we are no longer aliens, but citizens of heaven. That we are guiltless and blameless before him. What an amazing picture. He writes, Paul writes him to the uh, people in Ephesus, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Like we're coming up on Easter. This very past, like this is what we're talking about. Easter is a celebration that those who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It isn't just about bunnies and chocolate and, and springtime. It is a celebration of what God Almighty has done through his son. That those who are in this camp in this dominion of darkness, enslaved to sin, have been transferred and now are guiltless before God. That is awesome. And that is the good news that we celebrate at Easter. And so in review, Jesus is king. Jesus is the mere image of God. Jesus is before and over all things. And Jesus is our savior king. And so what do we do with this this morning? Well, I wanna give you three things to think about, and the first one is I want you to put it back in park. Stop, rest, and marinate in the truth of Colossians 1, 15 through 22. None of us would go to the Grand Canyon or the Grand Tetons or Yellowstone or the ocean and just drive on by and take a picture out the window and like, let's keep going. Because they're awesome. And because of the busyness in life, we tend to do that with, with God's word. It's like, oh, we're gonna open it, check off the box. Good Christian, I'm gonna move on with my day. I wanna encourage you to rest and marinate in God's word. Let it soak into you. Put it in park. And look, pray through the awesomeness of Jesus in Colossians chapter one. Secondly, ask yourself this question. What kingdom does my life reflect? As Jesus is the perfect image of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are ambassadors of Christ. As the church, that we are to be reflections of Jesus, right? That Jesus reflects God and we reflect Jesus. And so would you take a moment, maybe here in a few seconds before you leave today, 
or sometime this afternoon or this evening, ask yourself, if someone were to look at my life, what would be what I'm reflecting? What would it show? What does my life reflect? And thirdly, I would ask you, would you be willing to trust Jesus with all the things? Because he is over all the things. And he is an inviting savior who says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Watch from me and learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. So will you bring those things to him and let the peace of Christ guard your heart and your mind? You see, the result of Jesus' authority over all things is that he has transferred his status and privilege to us by the blood of, of, of the cross. Jesus is not a king that uses and abuses his authority to shame and control and guilt and manipulate. No. Jesus uses his power and his authority and his privileged status as son of God to set you and I free from the domain of darkness. By his activity, he makes you and I reconciled to God, blameless and citizens of his kingdom. He doesn't say, hey, do all these things, earn it, you gotta do it. He says, I will come do it for you and I will welcome you in. Jesus is the creator who entered his creation in order to redeem it that you and I might be with him. And so we can marinate and rest in that awesomeness of our savior. So let me pray as the prayer teams come forward and we would love to pray with you and for you after the service. That's our privilege. If you can't get prayed for at church, where are you gonna get prayed for? So take advantage. Uh, let's, let's pray and we'll be done with this morning. God, thank you for uh, this morning. Thank you for your word. Thanks for Colossians. Thank you for Paul. And the, and the way that Paul writes about the awesomeness and the supremacy and the preeminence of Jesus. God, would you help us? Spirit, would you help us not become too familiar that Jesus would become ordinary and that we would seek out other things? Lord, I pray that as we open your word, as we hear your word taught, that we would always be in awe of your goodness and your grace and your mercy, that you would offer us salvation. We praise things in your name, amen. Crossings, have a great day. We'll see you next week.